Okay, yeah, so yeah, as Quinn was saying, we are now called Full Stack Manitoba because we're going to do more than just .NET here. So I brought my groups over that were kind of a little defunct, uh, the JVM group and the functional group. So we'll just all have it here. Um, hopefully we'll get you know more people from those groups to, to come out. I know I, I sent it out pretty late because I wasn't too sure of um, the, uh, if we were going to meet up or not. I was just going to transfer them over, but that's fine. So yeah, if there's any questions about that, nothing really will change. Just we're going to cover probably, I wouldn't even say we're going to cover more broad topics because it seemed like the, the, the .NET group was anyways, especially when Amir was here. We, we're seeing everything like Elixir and all sorts of functional stuff. So now we'll just continue doing that. And it's just called Full Stack Manitoba. Maybe a little bit more inviting, uh, especially for like the web front end people and that kind of thing. So, yeah. <clears throat> works. Okay, so my name is Craig. Um, I do consulting, but I also run the startup called Crowdscriber. So we um, basically make it easy for our content producers to transcribe and translate their videos through crowdsourcing. Um, if you ever need to get a hold of me, uh, you can either get a hold of me on our Slack or, you know, by Twitter or by my email address. So. Oh, and Sean, he's also my co co <laughs> So, um, so, yeah, let's just get right into it. I, I figured what I'd do instead of just going right into parser combinators is, you know, what, what is kind of parsing? Like, why, why do we want to do this? What are we doing? Because that's a lot of times, you know, like, I kind of know what we're doing because 20 years ago I took a compiler construction course, but that's all we drank, drank away a long time ago. So it was really good to refresh my memory on exactly what we're doing when we're parsing. So, I think to boil it down, um, really what we're doing is we're trying to evoke some kind of structure, some kind of meaning out of textual data. Um, and the way we do that is we have, in parsing, we have a thing called a lexer, which is sometimes called a tokenizer or a scanner. And then we have a parser, or a parser generator, which takes the output from the lexer, which is a bunch of tokens, and says, okay, is this correct based on a certain syntax or grammar? And then, okay, what should we do with this now that we know that it's correct? That should become clear as we go on through the um, presentation. So here's a piece of text. You know, demonstrates using every letter in the uh, English language. Um, so the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. So if we were to give this to a lexer and a parser, you know, what can it evoke from this? Well, it could break these all up into words, and we can just have one general word token, and then we just have a big stream of words, word tokens. It's not too exciting. I mean, it'd be good if we were using that to count words or something like that. That, that might be a good, uh, good thing, but we can also do think more complicated things because English has a grammar. Um, whether or not people actually, you know, use it, uh, abuse it, what have you, we have a grammar. Um, so we can actually break this sentence up into the grammatical tokens of the English language. So the is an article, it's a determiner. Um, you know, that's, these are adjectives, a noun, or so on and so forth. Um, so given a grammar, a tokenizer should be able to, given some rules, go through this sentence and break up the sentence into all these various tokens. The lexer or the tokenizer can do that, but it has no clue if this sentence is actually structured properly. That's where the grammar actually comes into the play. You know, okay, yeah, we have something and we don't have any unrecognized words, so you know, but are they organized in the right way to make sense? Okay. So that's where kind of parsing comes in. So we take this sentence again 
And we say, well, is it syntactically correct? And the way that we do that, and we can say to ourselves, you know, it's grammar time. We need, we need a grammar that actually tells us whether this English sentence is structured properly. You know, we, we don't have words mixed up, we don't have ones missing, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, it's really wishing I hadn't been here. Okay, so <laughs> here, here would be a grammar that would describe <clears throat> this portion of the English language. So, this is kind of like in um, Bacchus Nor form, BNF. Uh, it's a syntax for describing grammars. So we can say we have a start point, or we could call this the sentence. And a sentence is broken up into a noun phrase and a verb phrase. So a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase. OK, doesn't tell us too much, because we don't know what a noun phrase is and a verb phrase. So you probably guess what's going to come next. Well, a noun phrase is uh, one or, or zero or more articles, so the, you know, that kind of thing. Zero or more adjectives, like quick, brown, you know, describing a noun, and then a noun. But at its very basic point, uh, part, it could just be a noun, right? And so on and so forth. So we can get the entire grammar that denotes this entire sentence. And what a parser will do is it will take this grammar as an input, it will take the tokens that were generated by the tokenizer, and it will try, it will, first of all, it will take this grammar and it will break it up into a, into a parse tree. So we start at S, you know, and noun, on the, noun phrase on the left, article, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and then it tries to see, well, can I take that sentence and can I actually put that as leaf nodes at, into the street. If I can't at any point, well, it doesn't parse. That wasn't a valid English phrase. And hopefully you get some kind of meaningful, you know, like error message. Yeah, you might be getting your hopes up though. But uh, something to indicate that, well, you know, I, I, found, um, I found a noun, or I found blah instead of finding a verb at this point. So is there any question? And I, I kind of have this like dotted thing because we're not using that part of the first tree because there was no noun phrase in, in, in our previous uh, in here. So, okay, well, do that good. So, oh, no, I can't see that. Um, so yeah, there was no noun phrase at, on the last part of that. So it was a preposition phrase. <clears throat> phrase like this. It's a problem when you have lots of animations. It's like I can't go back easily. Okay, so what I've described is basically the, the process of parsing. You have input, it goes into a tokenizer, but the tokenizer has to know something about the input. What what can it make tokens of? So typically, you feed in a grammar. It's it doesn't have to be the full grammar, but a lot of these um, these lexer parser combos they just use the same file to denote what the tokens are and what the syntax or grammar is, okay? So it just, uh, all I'm saying is that you need some kind of definition of what tokens are so that the tokenizer can do its job. Okay, so then once it does that, all the tokens, and it doesn't care if those tokens are in the right order or anything like that, it just is flying through the sentence and going, that's a noun, that's a verb, that's an adjective, et cetera, et cetera, and it makes a token stream out of that feeds that token stream into a parser. It should be a parser. Well, it is parser, okay. And that parser will also use that grammar to say, hey, you know, um, I need a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And that noun phrase is a blah, blah, blah. It builds its parse tree. Then it examines the tokens and says, can I fit all these things in to the tree? Or are there some things that are on border and I, I can't make sense of it, so I'm going to have to arrow up. So that's when you get your parchment. It's probably a good time to, hey, to stop because I think I hear the pizza. Come. <laughs> but do you guys have any questions? All right.
Okay. Just to go over this again. <clears throat> Input, tokenizer, read some kind of definition of what tokens in are in this. Makes a stream of tokens, sends it to the parser. Parser looks at the grammar, says, is this syntactically correct? Based on the parse tree that I create from the grammar. But really, what's being produced here? Other than the parser telling us, yeah, this is syntactically correct. Like, what, what do we do? Like, do we do something with this parse tree? Like, what if this is a computer program we're trying to compile it? Like, we're trying to make sense of it and actually produce some type of other bytecode or something like that. How do we do that, right? So <clears throat> hopefully I'll be able to explain that by the end of this. Okay, so we'll go through some history. This is where. I think, what, what's your name? Sorry. Dale. Dale. Okay. Um, so as Dale was saying, you know, back in university, he was playing around with things called Yak and Bison and Flex and Lex and all those kind of cool old Unixy things. And um, those are definitely an option. But you could roll your own parser if you wanted to. But I, I'm <laughs> telling you, like I remember back from my compiler uh, construction course, yeah. It looks like a big case statement, and you're tokenizing things, and you're, it's it's not the prettiest thing. I mean, you could totally do it, but it might be a little bit fragile, especially if your grammar is going to change much over time. Like maybe you're using this parser to parse your own config file format because you don't like XML, you don't like YAML, that kind of thing. So you could use the old school lexers and parser generators, like. Lex and Flex, so Lex is like what would have shipped with Unix back in the day, and Flex has got rewritten and open sourced. Um, <clears throat> Yak and Bison, so again, same thing. <clears throat> but, I mean, they're not the nicest things to work with. And um, so, just to give you an example, this would be like your Lex, your input to Lex. Here, so you're defining what your tokens are. So you're, and this is some other stuff. Um, this is actually this file is actually generated by the parser, but we won't get into that. We don't need to get into that. Really, what's important is this part here. And what it's saying is like when you see a colon, well, that is the token called colon. When you see you know, uh, a comma, that's a comma. When you see anything that's a one digit. Well, what we want to do is we want to convert that from ASCII to an integer with that text that comes in. So it's just like that. The Lexer is doing a little bit more. It's, it's actually breaking it up into tokens, and then it's, it's going, oh, and by the way, you know that, that integer token? Well, here's the actual integer, so that you don't have to convert that later on. And this is a more like complicated regular expression, but it's basically something within quotes do this. So that's that's the token definition. <clears throat> now the actual parser definition itself, the actual grammar, you can kind of ignore all this stuff because what this does is this this stuff here just gets fired directly into the parser generator. Parser generator? The, the parser basically that this uh, Bison, yeah, this Bison compiler is going to make for you. So it's actually going to take the C code and just going to put it into your parser for you. Okay, this is where kind of the grammar starts, kind of starts. It's saying, hey, you know what? This um, this grammar here is going to need a colon token, a common token, a string token, a num token, which are basically defined over here. This is kind of off screen, so you can't see it. <clears throat> Then, you can imagine if we scroll down, this is going to be the rest of it. This is kind of where we're getting into the start of a, of a grammar. So we have pair, and a pair is going to be a string followed by a colon, followed by a num. Uh, yeah, okay, so the start is a pair list. A pair list is a comma, a pair list with a comma, and then a pair, like, so on and so forth. It's just a definition of the grammar of whatever this guy is trying to parse, right? And you'll notice that when we do find a pair, 
when the parser does find a pair, basically what it's doing is it's injecting this piece of code with the first thing and the third thing it found. This piece of code goes into that parser that, it, that Bison is generating for you. And that make pair function is actually something that you um, specify lower down in the file. Right? So Bison's taking the grammar, it's taking the tokens, and it's making you a C class not a class, but you know what I mean, um, that knows how to build the parse tree for this grammar, and then it knows what to do when it finds various parts of that parse tree. So it's kind of building up your internal structure, and that's like, you know, with the woman shrugging her shoulders, that's literally what the parser is doing for you. It's, it's making this other internal data structure that you can now, your program can now operate on. It's making sense of the parse tree for your specific application. Somebody else might take the same grammar and, and completely create a different type of internal data structure to represent it. You know, it's up to them. And it's flexible enough to use. Does that make sense? Roughly? Yeah. Okay, so your other options are you could use a, a modern Lexer and parser generator. So the one I know of is Ampere. So I remember using Antler back in the 2000s because it was Java-based, and I really was using Java a lot, still am, back then. Um, so what this would allow me to do is basically I could create um, the same kind of grammar file and token file and that kind of thing, and it wouldn't spit out a C parser, it would spit out a Java jar file that I could then go and use from in, within one of my programs and I could say, here's some input, parser, go parse that, and then let me visit parts of the parse tree so that I can do something with it. It was really cool. And uh, later, like be before, it was just like text files, like kind of like Bison and, 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 um, and Flex, where you're just editing text files and you've got a command line that you run, and then it creates your parser and your lecture for you in Java. Uh, then, Somebody uh, by the name of Prashant Diva, he went and created this thing called Ampler Studio, which is great because you could have like a graphical, like it would actually like make a graphical representation of your parse tree for you. It was just, it was awesome. And then that has flourished since, and now every IDE has an Ampler plugin that pretty much does the same thing. Okay. So here's a little video. So I'm in VS Code, and I'm going to the Ampler. I want to install the Antler um, extension. So you can do that. <clears throat> then we're going to create an input file that we're going to parse. So I have that same sentence, quick brown fox, don't door, lazy dog. We're going to create a grammar for it in the grammar syntax that Antler understands, which is extended Bacchus nor form, right? There's tons of documentation on this. It can get pretty gnarly, but this is actually a pretty simple grammar. And you can see what I did was I just took each step of that grammar that I found for parsing you know, the quick brown fox, and I just translated that into what Hamper will understand as that grammar. Okay, so we have our input file, we have our grammar file. Notice that we don't have a tokens file. Okay, because it's just all embedded within this grammar. It knows what the tokens are because they're kind of like, when it builds the parse tree, it's, they're kind of like the pre-terminal leaves of the parse tree. It goes, oh, that's a literal. No, these things are literals. Those are actually tokens. No, this isn't a token per se. No, so I have to do a little mark. Okay. So now we can launch Anchor. So we just run it. And boom, we get a parse tree. So here's the parse tree down here. If we want to, I don't know if this is bright enough for you guys, but it also visualizes the parse tree. I wish it went a little bit deeper because I feel like stopping at MP and BP is not doing the parse tree justice because there's still a lot more underneath there. But that's what we get. And then it also shows what it parsed and what it considers valid for that grammar. <clears throat> now we can inspect the files generated by 
Amper. So this is the actual lexer for my grammar. It's just a bunch of Java code. If you're not a Java programmer, you can get it. Uh, spit out your JavaScript, C Sharp, probably almost every modern language, you know, under the sun, you can get a parsing code. So that's kind of cool, right? So you are if you're a C guy, you can still use Antler, generate your C parser, so you don't have to use Yak and Flex or Bison Flex. But if you're a Java guy or Node guy or something like that, you can still use Antler. Same exact grammar. It'll just output in a different language. It's pretty cool. Um, when I first used Antler, the first time I ever used it was um, back in like 2000 sometime. I had to, we, <laughs> it was an old Visual Basic application where we had done, we had read, uh, oh, what's his name? He was at um, Prairie DevCon last year. Um, Rocky? Rocky's Muck. Rocky Lakota. Lakota. Yeah, Lakota? Right. Rocky Lakota. <laughs> He wrote this awesome book on like, hey, you can create three-tiered applications where you have you know, your presentation and you have your services and you have your repos. So we actually wrote like this whole repo layer that um, based on a data ta database table, it would create all the objects for that to represent that thing, make, basically make a cred thing. Right? This is back in the 2000s. This was like so cool. But one of the things that we had to do was we had to access our database all through stored procedures. So I think I got really tired of writing sort procedures manually. So I just found the transact SQL you know, grammar for Antler, and I made a parser, and then I was able to actually generate my own sort procedures programmatically, mm -hmm. and just inject them right into the database. So it was pretty cool. So let's see if we invalidate the data. You know what's going to happen here, and you can probably guess. So we're going to put another article. Uh, where it shouldn't be. So we have double articles. I'm going to run it. I'll save it first. Run it, and we'll get an error. So I didn't expect that the to be there. And it gives you a nice little error about it saying, hey, where I expected the determiner, I got two. So, yeah, whatever. Um, now, our grammar is not that sophisticated because I can actually go in and just put another adjective, the same adjective. I can put, you know, that's not right. I put in the wrong video. Darn it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, there was a, another video that actually showed putting brown in again. So it's like the brown, brown, the quick, the brown, quick, brown box. Like it, it will allow that because we just specified in our grammar that there can be as many adjectives as humanly possible. We don't check for duplicates. I'm sure we could, but we didn't. So. And the great thing with with Adler is like you know, it's like all open source, and there's a whole repository of like almost any. Thing you want to parse, you just go to this GitHub repo and you find it. And then there's like assembler, basic, C, um, you name it, you can parse it. So there you go. There's a grammar for C. <clears throat> there's a grammar for Scala in there too. So, okay. So this is why you guys can. So, parser commenters, how does this all fit in? Because it seems like you know we have a lot of options here. Well. The one thing I don't like about Antler is I kind of have like this external tool, essentially, that I'm using that I have to fit into my build cycle. Um, so, you know, I can update the grammar, but then I have to build that and then use that. And it's just, I don't know, it's like, if I just want to parse something really simple, yeah, maybe I wouldn't want to have to go through all of that trouble, right? So what parser combinators allow you to do is it allows you like inside the language just using the language features um, to build these reusable token parsers that also compose to create a syntax. Okay. Really nicely and really easily. I mean, it looks scary as heck when you see the code, but it's actually not when it gets explained to you. Okay. So here's an example. So 
one of the things I had to do uh, for Crowdscriber, because um, one of the things we allow you to do is if you already have your own subtitles for a certain language, you can upload those to our system. Um, and then we can actually use that as, so in Crowdscriber, one of the things that we allow you to do is, you know, you can, you can go ahead and subtitle a video in English, if it's in English. Um, but you can also use those English subtitles as the basis for a translator. So a translator, you want somebody to translate this into French. So when you're dealing with translators, there's translators that are good at listening comprehension. There's translators that are good at reading comprehension. Probably most of them are good at reading comprehension. Or no, that's not true. Because conversational ones would be listening. So what we do is we put the English subtitles next to the ones that you're going to enter. So that you can always reference back, like if you heard something in English and went like, ah, what was that? What did they say? You can always just look at the subtitles. So I needed a way for, if you already had the subtitles in a subtitle format, we should be able to parse those and load those alongside in our database. So there's this format called SRT, subrip, subrip um, um, files. And they're pretty gangster. Like, I don't think there was a like a formal body that created these things. It's just like somebody wanted to subtitle foreign films and they created this application and this was the format that they chose kind of thing. So there's not really a great grammar out there or anything like that. Um, but I was lucky enough that I found somebody that had written a part, SRT parser in Scala. But it didn't parse all the SRT files that I had tried on it. So it was doing a decent job, but it wasn't encapsulating the entire spec, so I actually had to like dig into the code. And I found out that it was using parser generators. I'm like, oh, I remember those scary things from that presentation. I don't want anything to do with this. But I had no choice. It was either write my own parser from scratch, like I was thinking, oh, I'll use Antler, and I'm sure there's like a thing, but I'm like, I don't want to do that. I already have this. Um, so, yeah, okay, so this is an example of like a really simple parser here. Uh, just disregard that it says SRT parsers, but um, there's a base class called regex parsers that gives you a bunch of like convenience uh, methods and, and all that kind of stuff, implicits and all this kind of stuff in Scala. And really what you're doing is you're just, you're creating your little parsers that know how to parse tokens and know how to parse sentences. Um, as just normal everyday functions, and they just return a, class, a special class called parser. And this one, I, it's a parser of, of type any because really it doesn't return anything from here. It doesn't produce anything. It just all it does is it matches one of these guys, and then it goes, yeah, I matched it, but it doesn't actually like deliver you which thing it was that got parsed. Okay, okay. so we have EOL. And what you'll notice is that we have these little pipe characters, and then down here we have this little, you know, uh, less than and then the tilde. Hmm. Those are weird. It's not part of Scala per se. I mean, this is, but it's not in this context. So those things are actually the parser combinators. Okay. So <laughs> there's a lot of funky stuff going on here, but um, EOL has to pass back a parser of type any. Well, this, you know, this kind of looks like a bunch of strings with an or symbol between it, okay. So what Scala knows, and when you import this regex parsers, it has a bunch of implicits in there that know that, oh, okay, you used a literal string and it's expecting a parser to be parsed back. I have this implicit function that knows how to turn a literal string into a parser of type. <coughs> So literally, we're just saying, you know, look for an EOL, like try and parse an EOL character. It might be one of these, it might be this, you know, depending on what system you're, you're parsing on, or it might be that weird one. And then this is a little bit more complicated. This is a, a block separator. So we're saying that a block separator is any EOLN followed by an optional white space character, which might sound weird because you're like, it's at the end of the line. How could there be optional white space after that? Well, you have to think of it like a parser would think of it. 
Um, it doesn't think of your files as all on separate lines. It just thinks of it as a bunch of text that's separated by these backslash ends throughout, right? So what this is saying is I'm, I recognize a block as being an EOLN, and then I don't care if there's a bunch of blank lines below it. Match that too, and then get me to the next thing that's meaningful. So that's what that's doing. So what ends up happening here is we have the EOLN parser. We have this OWS parser, which is probably defined up here in, in regex parsers. And we're using a parser combinator to then create a new parser that knows how to parse an EOLN followed by an optional white source. They're, com they're combining those two parsers, and now you have a super parser that knows how to do both of those. Does the uh, parser override then that, that operator to create that functionality, or is that inherent to scale? No, 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 this is, this is just a function, actually. It's right, because it's overriding that function, exactly. right? and then it just calls it through the implicit sort of it's space. Probably, it's probably space. even, yeah, it's exactly. just composing it effectively. Exactly, exactly. Hmm. Yeah, you got it, you got it. So, I mean, it looks scary, but eh, it's not. I mean, it's just taking a parser, it's taking a parser, it's combining them, and now this thing can do what these things can do individually. It doesn't make sense. This kind of looks weird, though, you know. Uh, you know, what, what, what's this thing? What, what, why, why is it pointing that way? Okay, that's on the next slide. No, it's not. This is a more complicated one. I just wanted to scare you a little bit more. I'm not going to go through this right now. Uh, but I just wanted to show you that, oh yeah, you know, these things can get to look pretty complex. But really, it's the same basic concept, just with a little bit more stuff in it. Like we got this thing, we got, you know, we got Oh, look, it's pointing this way now. Not <laughs> <laughs> like so, there's all this, there's all this sort of stuff. And it's gonna, now it's going to be explained on the next slide. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that reminds me, there's this guy. I don't know, he's not active in Scala anymore because he kind of got, there's drama around him. But anyways, he's a hassle <laughs> now, and his name's and um, he created this, this library called And when that thing started out, he actually had emojis as function names. And it's crazy. It's like, like everybody's looking at this library. library. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, you know, everybody's like, this is really brilliant stuff, but why are you using emojis? Well, why wouldn't I? You know, like, I mean, so somebody, somebody came in and like, took all those out and made it. But it's still, you still get like tilde, tilde. No carrots, blah blah blah. It's still kind of crazy. Anyways, it's like was that Jeff Goldblum in uh, Jurassic Park? You know, just because uh, you couldn't do it, did you think you should? You know, if you should, um, that was probably getting to play there. So, okay, parser combinators. So, uh, it, I mean, I think of the parser combinators as the the things in between the the parsers, but this will create a parser. That's a literal parser. So if you type in quote, you know, double quote, dog, and that gets converted into a parser through Scala magic, um, you'll get a parser that can now be combined with something else, but it will match the literal dog. Okay. You can also match on regular expressions. So in Scala, if you want to make a regular expression, you just put it in, you put your regular expression in quotes. And then you just put dot r, and then there's this implicit function that operates on um, on strings. It goes, oh, you want to convert what's ever in here into a regular expression? Okay. Then what the parsing library will do is it will take that and it will convert it into a parser of type, you know, regular expression. Here's where it gets interesting. Okay, <clears throat> squiggle the tilde. So we've seen a tilde with like a left bracket and a right bracket, but we've never just seen a tilde on its own. If you see a tilde on its own, what it means is that Q follows P. So here's Q, and it follows after P. So when you're token, when you're seeing it in the token screen, it's going to be, say, if we had a uh, parser called um, keyword and we had a parser called expression, it's going to make sure that if we ask it to match the keyword, there should be an expression afterwards. If there's not, error, because Remember, this creates a new parser combinator, and that will error out if it does not find that in the sequence. Okay. 
here's where we get into the left bracket. So one of the things that these things also do is they also allow you to produce values from them. So P, you know, P tilde Q actually creates a parser that will have a keyword token and an expression token. It's kind of going to be like a, a parser of those two types. What this says is, listen, yeah, we, we want to match on an expression followed by a semicolon, but we don't actually care, we only care about the expression. Just disregard the semicolon like it didn't exist because I don't want it in the token stream. I don't want to deal with it when I'm, when I'm getting ready to do something with this. So it throws this part out and says, yeah, well, I need to match an expression followed by a semicolon. But once I find that, yeah, you're out of here. I'm going to leave this for somebody to do something productive. Okay. And, you know, exactly the same for P tilde, you know, right angle. Oh, where did I do? Okay. All right. Then you have optional. So, you know, we want to match, so this becomes P. We want to match, um, maybe we want to match an adjective, but if it's not there, don't sweat it. <coughs> Go on to the next thing, the next thing should be now. Okay. And we have another one called wrap, which is I can match a bunch of explanation points right in sequence. So there might be one, there might be two, there might be 50, there might be 100. I'll match them, no problem. And then we have this thing called rep set, which says, I want to match uh, this guy, um, but there has to be an EOLN after. So keep matching until that becomes false. And then you know, we, we get to do something with all those things I didn't found. But you know, this is just another parser combinator that you're looking for. This is probably something a little bit more complex, like a regex that knows what a line of text is but it has to be separated by this guy. So it just finds a text line, you know, without an EOLN, doesn't match on that. And then we have this other thing, the little hi-hats here, carrots. And what they let you do is they let you take a parser combinator, and after it matches something, it lets you take that something it matched and do something with it. Maybe convert it into something that makes sense to you. Because really, you know, if you're matching a piece of text, it's just going to be a piece of text. But what if that piece of text is a number? Or what if that piece of text is GPS coordinates? You probably want to convert that into some fancy format and use that later on. So in this case, so in this case, this P here is actually this entire thing. This is a parser combinator that got created by using this guy and this guy with plus in the middle. So it says there's going to be an match on an expression, keep that expression, then match a plus, disregard it, and match on this another expression, a following expression, and keep that as well, because I got that little guy there. And then we use these little hi-hats and we say, okay, let's unpack that. And we'll put whatever was matched here, we'll put it in variable A. Whatever was matched here, we'll put it in variable B, and then we'll do something with it. So we're going to call a function called add. And now, when we go and parse a file that has this kind of expression in it, and um, at the end, we end up with something meaningful, that something meaningful for this expression will be the actual result of adding the two expressions together. Make sense? So the plus in this case could be space, yep. any could, amount of plus. Could, yeah, could okay. be um, like star, or, you know, forward slash or dividing, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a literal, whatever you want to be, whatever you want to look like. So. Okay. So now we kind of know what's going to be the result of our parse tree. It's going to be a bunch of meaningful things that you use those little hi hats to create while the thing was parsing. Okay. Demo. Because <laughs> I kind of I use the video for for a reason, so I really screwed up and I ran out of time to video myself. Do 
Do you anything else? Okay. Any questions? Okay. So here I have my Scala REPL. So I can type in you know, val x equals one or something like that, and we'll evaluate it in Scala. So I should be able to do the same thing with the parsers. So I should be able to say x parser uh, string equals some literal girl. Swing, yeah, no. So I need to do that within function. So let's see, objects, my parser extends uh, reg x parsers. Oh, I might have to import. No, I think I already did. I may have to import that. Okay. Let's import. Scala.util.parsing.com.ridge.exparsers. Now I should be able to do that. No. Oh, what am I doing here? Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. So now I should be able to say def uh, <coughs> i literal subtype parser let's say string is equal to some token. For those not familiar with Scala, anything that you just leave on the last line, that's what's going to get returned from the function. <clears throat> and we'll get to see if all the implicit functions that are supposed to be in play here actually work. Okay, so if I type, so okay, just to explain what was going on here. So I created my own parser called my literal, and it's gonna match on a literal called some token. Now, that's just a string, but because I extended this regex parsers, it brings in all these fancy implicit functions. And one of them is gonna be, anytime you see a string, and it's expected that that should be of type parser string, create that for me. It just, like if you think about it during the Scala comp compilation phase, it goes, uh-oh, there's a string being passed back, but I expect a parser string. And then it looks up to see, are there any in implicit functions that have been defined in scope that take a string and make it into a parser of type string? Yes? Okay, just literally wrap this in that function so that it can do that. So it kind of has like a couple of compilation phases that it takes. Okay. Now, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to look at one of the parsers that I wrote. <clears throat> okay, so do for parsing. It's a parcel. Okay. So I should be able to say. Uh, SR, oops, my parser, dot parse all, and then, does that take, okay, so that'll be SRT, or sorry, my parser, dot my literal, <clears throat> and then the string, Success, great. Um, 
Hmm. Yeah. So basically what it passed me back was a success object that says, yep, I managed to parse some token using your parser here. So this was the input here. This was the parser that I'm asking it to parse. But if I mess this up, I should get like a failure back, which I did. So you can key off of these and you can then deal with failures and maybe adjust your input based off that. Now, I have a more complicated parser here. So I was kind of out of the woods when it came to the SRT parsing. So for subrib files, I was, I was pretty okay. I mean, I had to adjust the SRT parser that I grabbed off the internet, but you know, it wasn't too bad. I, but there was this other format I had to uh, handle called VTT. And um, this is actually a format that's, I guess, a little bit more robust than SRT. It's, it actually has a specification and Mozilla. Um, YouTube, you know, will actually give you, like, YouTube won't give you an SRT file back, but it'll give you a VTT file back. Uh, there's another one called timed text, which is kind of like XML-y, but VTT is very much almost like a hybrid between SRT and this other, like, um, you know, B, uh, this other, oh, what's the other one? Uh, I was just saying. or time text or something. But essentially, I didn't have a parser for it. There was no parser created for Scala. Um, again, I was kind of like, should I use Antler? I'm sure there's, there must be a grammar out there. But I kind of just took it as an exercise. I'm like, I'm going to build off of SR, the SRT parser. Maybe it'll take me a day of work. Uh, big deal. So it took me an entire weekend. Um, and it was very frustrating, and I had to start over again and all that kind of stuff. But once I get got to really know how to do the parser generators, it wasn't bad. Like in retrospect, it was hard because maybe I wasn't reading documentation. I was just trying to like, well, what if I put this in here? Oh, what if I do that? Do that. Then when I went out and actually read the documentation on it, and Orderski's book um, Programming in Scala has an entire chapter on parser generators, it all started to fall into place. And so what I can do is I can kind of show you what a VTT file looks like. So that's what it, it looks very similar to an, a subroot file. Okay. But there's also sorts of nuances in here that can happen. So, first of all, some groups never have a uh, it's kind of like header. VTT does. So, you can have, you always have to start a VTT web VTT file with the keyword web VTT. Then there could be something here, or there might not be something here. Um, it's very loose on on that. And uh, some of the parsers that I actually uh, saw out there, one of the online ones actually didn't even deal properly with the fact that there could be a comment. Like that's how bad this thing is, right? Or, you know, people just play fast and loose and they make kind of crappy parsers or whatever. Then you can have like whatever. We, it doesn't matter what's in here. It's just all text as far as VTT is concerned. All this stuff that is actually in here is based on, um, like I think I pulled this off of YouTube. I went and I went into like the uh, network inspector on a YouTube video. I pressed closed caption. I got the output and you know I found what it was. So this would be like metadata information that's being used by the YouTube player in order to show the subtitles. But it mean, means nothing to the spec or anything like that. So um, what it, essentially what, what these subtitles are called are called cues. Like when they start and stuff. So they're really their their technical terms are called cues. And what it's saying is um, uh, you can have cues that are of style this, which is just you know basically like CSS, um, or you can have them that are style like that. You won't actually see that down here because I stripped out all that information and didn't care about it. But what follows a blank line after WebVTT has to be this timestamp. So this is where the subtitle is going to show up um, 
when you're playing that video. And again, this stuff here, there could be something here, but there doesn't have to be. And YouTube does use this to put some metadata in, but you know, a lot of the parsers out there don't deal well with that, so I had to, I had to write them. Then you can have multiple lines of subtitles, each being um, separated by the lines kind of thing. Um, this one's, you know, I put this specifically in here because there's a tricky one where I actually have a space here. It's not just a, a new line character. So typically what I would do is if I just saw a new line character, that would mean that it's going to be starting a new block, but it's not, so I found that out the hard way. And then another subtitle. So these, these subtitles are going to show up, you know, stacked on top of each other with one blank line in between. If the player supports three lines subtitles, it might not. Usually they only uh, support two. And then so on and so forth. So if we look at the parser generator for that, I wish I had a good way to do it side by side, but the monitor is kind of small. Oh, maybe I can do this. No. Get right click on uh, yeah. Okay. So we're trying to parse this file. So Ah, thank you. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, but I. Oh, there's a button right at the top. Right there. This one? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Everybody see that? Okay. So. Okay. So we have this header key. So I have this parser uh, combinator that I created. This parser that I created called WebVTT header start. If we drill into that, because this is just a function, you can see that WebVT um, header start is just the literal WebVTT followed by a, what's called a text line, maybe, because that's going to be like that comment stuff. And what I'm doing to that text line is I'm actually going to return that text line. So remember we were talking about this little hi-hat syntax here? So this is uh, saying, yeah, if there is a text line that exists, because I have this dot question mark, so it, it might actually not be there. It's kind of like the optional thing. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert that to a string, whatever it is, and that's going to be the production of that. So the production of this entire WebVT header start is actually going to be a string, and it's going to be this line here, if it exists. And then it's also followed by uh, EOLN, which is kind of off the, the screen here. And we're saying that we actually don't care about the EOLN. So we're going to put that little angle bracket pointing to this. This is what we care about. We don't care about that. This is what we care about. This is going to be the production of that parser. OK. Now I can't remember how to go back. Just, oh, it's so simple. Okay, after that, we have web BTT header text. So th this would be like all this garbage here. So if we drill into that, here's where we're using the rep set. The resolution of the projector is a little smaller than my resolution. Okay. So, what we will be finding in this section here is what we're calling a, do, 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 a, head, a subtitle header. And, sorry, subtitle header is this part. Okay, so this is interesting. This is a pretty interesting thing. Okay, this is technically what a subtitle header is. It's anything that starts with the time codes and so on. 
So what we're saying is please repeat um, so long as you're not matching this guy. Okay, so essentially what we're saying is we want to skip this part. And so long as you're repeating and not finding any of these subtitle um, headers, um, we are going to want, I guess this That's option. That's skips the top. Yeah, so it skips this. It also doesn't produce anything from this that it finds. Lines from yes. the down to the mm -hmm. top. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I got confused. You're right. Optional line just says, ah, there might be something here, but it might be a blank line. Ah, there might be something here, it might be a blank line. But whatever all that stuff is, please produce that. And that's what's going to end up, that's what this parser is going to parse. It's going to produce. Okay, I'm not going to take you through this whole thing because it's like super tedious, but I did want to show you the subtitle block part because that's pretty interesting. So we'll go to subtitle block. There's a subtitle line or subtitle start. Separator, subtitle header. Yeah, yeah, here we go. So this subtitle header um, parser is going to parse this guy here. All the time coding and the nastiness that follows. So the first thing that it's going to parse, and it's kind of, again, interesting, in that this file format's so loosey-goosey that you might have a subtitle number above it, or you might not. That's up to you. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, Fun. it is a real flavor. <laughs> so, this is what we would do at that point. <laughs> I know. I, I mean, technically it doesn't. Or if you have that here, it will just go, oh, the order of these subtitles are ordered you know, from top to bottom and based on the time code. So, yeah. So anyways, so what it does is it matches the subtitle number, and I'll bet you dollars to donuts if I go into subtitle number of that parser generator, it's going to be, there might optionally be a number there. Um, then it's going to be followed by some white space, which white space is technically the OLM is white space as well. Um, so it might be there. Oh, that's what it is, right. So it might, so we are going to match a subtitle number, which probably does do a, an actual match on a number. But we're saying, yeah, it's kind of optional. Like, it doesn't have to be there. We don't care about it. What we care about is this next part, which is going to be a time, and then this, whatever an arrow is, then another time, and then an optional text line, which is all this garbage here. What we're going to produce from that, when we do match on that, is we're going to end up with a, something called the start time. We don't care what the arrow is. We're not going to do anything with it. So we just go, this is kind of a catch-all thing in Scala. We're saying, yeah, we don't care about it. And then we're going to get an end time. And then we're going to get, get a I don't care, because I don't care about any of this stuff. And we're going to get an I don't care about the UR. Then what we're going to do is we're going to make that into a subtitle block class, an object. So when I parse this entire file, what I end up having is I end up having a bunch of subtitle blocks. And I think that's actually the return type of main parser. That's your, that's your internal data type. That's my Green internal salt. data type, yeah. Exactly. So when I parse that entire thing, all I end up with is a bunch of my own domain objects that have been filled out. Now, it looks weird. It says, oh, actually, the main parser returns a VTT type. What is a VTT type? Well, it's an alias. It's an alias. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's an alias for a sequence of subtitle blocks, because that's all there. Um, technically, you know, I could, I could create a class above that that holds all that other garbage that's in the header, but I don't care about that. I just care about the subtitle. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, anything else? Yes, sorry. Sure, Alex. Yeah, go ahead. You sure? Oh, cool. Okay. Right. Um, further down in the file. Oh, sure. Thank you. 
Just watch Cole back down to the last. Yeah. Partially the two shots. Here, I'll get rid of. Okay, I'll get rid of this big guy. I think what I'll do is. Let's go. Just like so. Close all in. Um, right there on line 44. 44, yeah. Um, you've got the mm -hmm. underscores kind of chucking the values there. Is it plausible then that you could use the less than and greater than to go back to capturing at that point? Or is it because you have two broken groups that you needed to use that underscore syntax? No, or yeah. So use the catch alls at that point. Yeah, no, you, you can't use those. Because of the Here. fact that they're kind of like isolated from each other. Yeah, you know, in, I think in this context, actually, it's just saying that um, I have a I have a parser combinator yeah. that was composed of this parser combinator, and that parser combinator, and that parser combinator, and that parser. Combinator. But it's not doing matching at this point. It's already done all the matching. This is just the I found those are the values basically the ordinal object. position. Sorry, those, sorry, that are my right? Yeah, maybe. Is what I yeah, the, this is doing the matching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then this is doing the unpacking. It's saying like, out of this thing, I created this master parser generator that knows how to parse time followed by arrow followed by time. Right, because you're saying block. this is the, the shape of it, and this is what I'm interested yeah. in. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, so my my same question for line 41. You couldn't use that syntax there, could you, where you have the less than tilde, oh. greater than tilde? No, you could. You and could then that actually, would, that yeah, would obviate yeah, the yeah, more sure arrow. Like, and Instead of having this garbage here, I could have just put. I was just curious, right? No, you're right. You're right. Yeah, I okay. could have done that. That was probably like I was late at night. And... <laughs> well, sometimes this works. Sometimes it's expressive to see stuff like that, though, yeah. right? Because you're you're explicitly saying you're tossing those values again. It's it's one of the others. True. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. No, you're right. That was a good catch. Um, I'll drill down into um, start time. Start time. Start time. Oh, time. That's right. So this is this is the uh, parser generator that actually does go and unpack all that stuff. <laughs> I, see, I see your weekend there. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> in all fairness, I lifted and shifted this function from the SRT parser that I had grabbed out there. Ah, all right. Okay. Someone else. Because <laughs> that does look ridiculous. Yeah. It could, and it could be solved by just removing the stuff using the little carrot, or the, uh, the, yeah, the, the other the overrides or the ones from the software use. Yeah. <laughs> and it's good to call it Sakaskiart. Why does, why does Scala get such a bad rap? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Any, anything else? Yeah. So I noticed before you used question mark, and then at some point you used optional. Yeah, yeah. Um, why did I use, why did I shift between those two? Um, that is a good question. Because mm, yeah, like I'm seeing it right here, right? And then I'm probably using opt somewhere else. I think they they amount to the same thing. Um, I don't think there's any difference between them. No. I think it's basically if I would have wrapped this with opt, it would have been the same. Okay, so line shortcut. Line forty four now. Mm -hmm. You you were mapping those things I understand, but what if you just did start time, then tilde underscore and end time and you stop there? Would it just disregard the rest? Yeah, because then that case statement wouldn't hit. Because in Scala it's saying like, Oh, I'm looking for something like that. Oh but like five parameters oh, yeah. yeah. oh, yeah, come pattern match would oh, pattern match wouldn't get yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you couldn't just say tilt star, like, oh, I mean, you just couldn't say any amount oh, of... You, well, could, you know what? You could, ah. I think the way that Scala chooses that case statement there is actually yeah. part of it is it has to have the same number of parameters okay. as what the inbound okay. input is coming out of with. Uh -huh. So that's how Scala selects which case to match, yeah. and then type after that. Or maybe, I don't know, which, which one prioritizes first, but it looks at, like, you know, parameter count, type, and then uh, value. Like the actual value itself. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Anything else? One.
This is a good time to mention. <laughs> this is a good time to mention. This is an open source project, and uh, we, patches, patches are welcome. <laughs> so yeah, no. If you if you do want to play around with it, it's it is at GitHub.com and then forward slash Crowdscriber, and then you can find it from there. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you.